Hey, what's up guys? MTG Tournament Grinder here, and welcome to this week's episode of Modern. Uh, this time around, I'm still on Hardened Scales, and my opponent is on Bant Spirits. So, in my experience, this is actually kind of a tough matchup. Uh, they play lots of creatures, lots of flyers in particular, so it can be really hard for me to get the damage through if they have a good draw. But, so far, I have to say, this is a pretty good turn one. Basilisk Collar completes Metalcraft, and then with Metalcraft, Float Green, uh, Ancient Stirrings. I was hoping it would be a Hardened Scales, but um, we don't actually know my opponent is on Bant Spirits. All I've seen is his uh, Windswept Heath. So in the blind, yeah, I think Steel Overseer is the pick. And I think I would rate that like 8.5 out of 10 as far as my opening hands go. So, but n normally I would fast forward through this part. This is my opponent fetching out, uh, you know, cracking his fetch land. But it seemed like a good time to get a peek at what he's got going on. So of course I couldn't see this while recording, but uh, useful to look at now, going through it during commentary with you guys. Looks like the only thing non-typical I saw was a Birds of Paradise replacing Noble Hierarch. Um, but other than that, it looks like a pretty standard Bant Spirits list. Although, day of recording, I'm still left wondering what exactly is going on. Haven't seen any spirits. This could be like a Knight of the Reliquary combo deck with the Retreat to Korahum. Uh, there's several different things it could be, but all will become clear. Yeah. Unclaimed territory naming spirits. It's like, okay, now I know. You know, and actually, and Rattle Chains is a good first play, I think. He's not holding up any mana or anything like that. Um, but in the future, he'll be able to play all of his spirits at instant speed. And really, spirits is just trying to be tricky. Interact with the vial, get cocos. Do tricky things that change the board state at instant speed. And I, I am just going to go ahead and play out my hand, it looks like. Spirits does have access to Path to Exile in the main board. So by playing my Steel Overseer, uh, I'm kind of just hoping he doesn't have it. Because Steel Overseer always is a bit of a sandbag for, for removal. Um, you can't let me untap with him. At least it's really bad if you do. So most people, if they have the removal, will choose to use it right away. Interesting though. So my opponent shocked in a Temple Garden and passed the turn. It makes me think he has some 3 mana creature that he wants to cast at instant speed. One in particular comes to mind, Spell Queller. So I'm thinking I would like to use my resources uh, with the cards I already have on the battlefield instead of casting a new spell to get Spell Quellered. Because I have to, uh, I'm not very fond of the idea of losing my Hangerback Walker to a Spell Queller. My opponent is just double checking with me uh, that I haven't activated Steel Overseer. And for now, no I haven't, I'm just swinging for one lifelink death touch. Assuming he won't block, because Rattle Chains is actually pretty nifty. So in response to no blocks, I will activate my Steel Overseer and he goes to Path to Exile. So this is a pretty common mistake. Um, to no fault of my opponents, I can remember thinking the exact same way. Um, I'm explaining to my opponent now that like, even though he's path to exiling my guy with the ability on the stack, um, and here I'm using my servo token as a stand-in for Steel Overseer's ability on the stack. Path to exile will resolve first, but moving our way down the stack, Steel Overseer's ability will still resolve. Um, so I mean, that's definitely a good question. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out quite the way my opponent was hoping it would. Um, I'm informing him now that the right time to have done that would have been still during his turn while my Steel Overseer had Summoning Sickness. 
I get to untap with my basic land that way if he does it on my uh, on his instep. Um, but if he waits till any other time, like even to my upkeep, the path to exile land will come in tapped. But I'll just be able to activate my Steel Overseer in response. So when to use Path to Exile is actually kind of can be kind of tricky sometimes. Uh, but still in my end step, flash in Selfless Spirit. So he's got four damage in the air already, and without my Steel Overseer, my board is looking a little lackluster. Yeah, swing for four. No flyers, no blocks. Looks like he has an action before damage. Yikes, Drag School Captain. So not only does it make it six damage instead of four, but now all of his other spirits have hexproof. So I really, really would need like a walking ballista like now, essentially. I need to be able to kill that, that first Drag Skull before he plays the second one. Because double Drag Skull Captain is like the lock. It all has hexproof. It all is getting plus two, plus two, and there's nothing I can do. Well, it looks like I did not draw my walking ballista. <laughs> I have three hangerback walkers in hand, though. I mean, and hangerback walkers turn into thopters. So hopefully, if I go ahead and play out all my walkers that I can, I will draw into a sack outlet and be able to make some, some flying blockers. But I have to admit, that's kind of a shaky line. I'm depending heavily on the top of my library. But again, assuming he won't block, you have to go ahead and get in for two. I mean, even just getting in for one or two lifelink is kind of keeping me in this race. My opponent had to fetch and had to shock. And then he's been disinclined to block this whole time. So I'm actually doing okay as far as life totals go. For now. Yikes. But here he is swinging for uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Oh my gosh. And there's the thing I was worried about. Second copy of Drag Soul Captain. So that makes it from 8... Uh, to actually 11 damage. Well, I thought I had time to find an answer. I guess it looks like I need the top deck an answer right now. But, I mean, Walking Ballista, it's too late. He's got Hexproof on everything. So the only hope... So it looks like I drew an Evolutionary Leap. Well, I mean, okay, so Evolutionary Leap is a sack outlet. It's not an Arcbound Ravager like I was hoping. But I do have two green sources, including the Max Opal, so I could both play Evolutionary Leap and activate it to sack a Hangerback Walker. But at this point, I think it's just too little too late. Evolutionary Leap is, is not the sack outlet that I needed. What I needed was an Arcbound Ravager to uh, make my Arcbound Worker absolutely huge and gain enough life to still be in this. Yeah, not everyone is familiar with Evolutionary Leap. I'd say Leap, and then Animation Module, and maybe Phyrexia's Core and Ruins of Warren Reef. All those new cards that like weren't played in Modern before Hardened Scales, uh, everyone has to like take a second and look at them and read them. Uh, which is understandable. I mean, I had to do the same thing the first time I saw the card. But it's pretty obvious. It's it's pretty much all, all the cards that weren't in original Affinity um, trip people up. They're like, wait, 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 I'm not quite used to this. <laughs> well, looks like I'm holding up Exactly one mana, one green source, that is the Mox Opal. So, interesting, he's not attacking all out. I mean, my board is kind of scary. He wants to leave back one blocker, and I think that's smart. So, yep. 
as I had planned, make a green with the Mox, activate Evolutionary Leap, sacrifice Hanger Mackwalker. For some reason I'm being picky about <laughs> which tokens I use. They're not going to be around for very long, so I don't think it matters much. But, um, block block. Uh, and, of course, finish resolving Evolutionary Leap. Uh, Steel Overseer. That's not what I was hoping for. I think with an Arcbound Ravager, there's a chance that, like, I could win with Infect, honestly, out of, out of nowhere. Hmm. <clears throat> so the only unblocked creature was the Drag Skull. It's a 3-3 three, three from the other Drag Skull, so take three. He is at 11. Yikes, another blocker, another selfless spirit. I think the fact that he had another creature to play, second main phase, was really the nail in the coffin. Because if I drew an Arcbind Ravager, and he only had the one blocker, then there was a chance I could squeak in quite a lot of damage. Look, I even did draw the Ravager. Darn, darn, darn. Well, I mean... You can't say I didn't try. I did my absolute best to kind of claw my way out of this bad situation. But Spirit Span. That turn he flashed in the second Drog Skull and swung for 11 was really what did me in. <laughs> and I'm too nice here. My opponent was about to say, take two, no blocks. And I, I, I asked him, are you sure? Kind of like with that leading tone. And now he's thinking, ah, uh, actually, maybe I will block. <laughs> Darn it! I was too telling with my tone of voice and uh, with my kind of leading question. But I want my opponents to make the choices they would like to have made. I don't want them to think later. Oh, I, I, I'm smarter than that. I knew, I knew that, but I just didn't do it. So. Uh, if you want, I mean, blocking is fine. I think that'll mean that I'm killing a Drag Skull Captain. So I have a chance to top deck another Walking Ballista in order to kill the other Drag Skull Captain. I don't know. Those are some big ifs. Some big, big maybes. Yeah, even if I draw a Walking Ballista at this point, I think it would just be too little, too late. But, uh, but a guy can dream, a guy can hope. Gotta hope for the best and prepare for the worst. But um, speaking of the worst, I believe um, I just saw my first misplay. And that was, he blocked with a Drag Soul Captain. My Arcbound Worker had Death Touch. The Drag Soul Captain is still on the battlefield. So I think under normal playing conditions, in my normal state of mind, I would have caught that immediately. Um, but I must have been feeling slightly under the weather on the day of recording. And I missed that all-important <laughs> uh, death touch trigger. It's not really a trigger, but it certainly matters now. But it looks like I have the same plan as I did last turn. Um, activate the Hangerback Walker's ability, but then I'll float green with the Mox. Sacrifice the Mox. Sacrifice the Worker. Looks like sacrifice everything I can. Except the Basilisk Collar, because I think having lifelink on my next turn would be really critical. And uh, besides the whole Death Touch not killing the Drag Skull misplay, I think this is another one. My goal is to put as much as I can on the Hangerback Walker. Use the green that I floated to sack it to Evolutionary Leap. But as we're about to see, uh, my opponent will cast Path to Exile in response. See, so here's the path. And I just say, oh, well, you got the path. Too bad for me. I lose. But really, uh, sacrificing the Hangerback Walker is part of the cost from Evolutionary Leap. So by the time I've paid the green and activated Evolutionary Leap, um, my creature is no longer on the battlefield. So that path technically shouldn't have been able to have been cast at that time. But let's go ahead and jump into some sideboarding action, and I will catch up with you guys in game two. Alrighty, as for the sideboarding, I didn't get a good look at what my opponent brought in, but if his list is anything like the lists on MTG Top 8, he might have access to Knight of Autumn, that is one colorless, one green, and one white, 
For a 2-1 that says, when it enters the battlefield, choose one. Put two plus one plus one counters on Knight of Autumn, destroy a target artifact or enchantment, or you gain four life. So in this matchup, it's good for its second ability, destroy a target artifact or enchantment. Hardened Scales would probably be a good target, or just any of my really good artifact creatures that are going to help me win. I'd say this card is definitely worth bringing in if you've got it. This deck also has access to Rest in Peace, which is a really, really good card against Hardened Scales. That's one colorless and one white for an enchantment that says, when Rest in Peace enters the battlefield, exile all cards from all graveyards. If a card or token will be put into the graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So you may not think of Hardened Scales as a graveyard deck, but Modular reads, when this creature is put into the graveyard, you may move its counters to another target colorless creature. With Rest in Peace on the battlefield, your things never touch the graveyard. Everything gets exiled. So no Modular, no death triggers at all, which includes Hangerback Walker. You do not get the counters whenever it dies with Rest in Peace on the battlefield. So this card is actually low-key, like super good against Hardened Scales. There's a chance also that they will have Settle the Wreckage. To white white, exile all attacking creatures target player controls. That player may search his or her library for that many basic land cards, put those cards onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle his or her library. I could see an argument for bringing this in against Hardened Scales. It's not like traditional affinity where you swing in with the one dude that has cranial plating and is all super big. There are a lot of games where I end up swinging relatively wide with all my tokens or whatnot. So I think this is a maybe. You might bring this one in. And then they have Stony Silence or at least access to it. Uh, of course, if you have this card, bring it in against Hardened Scales. It's a two mana white enchantment that says activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. So that means no tapping my Dark Seal Citadel or Mox Opal for mana. I can no longer sacrifice things to Arcbound Ravager. I can't put any counters on a Hangerback Walker or Walking Ballista or even activate a Steel Overseer's ability. So this card really shuts me down. And last but certainly not least is Worship. That is three and a white for an enchantment that says, if you control a creature, damage that would reduce your life total to less than one reduces it to one instead. So this card is particularly good, I think. The odds of spirits not having any creatures are pretty low, especially if they get the double drag skull captain thing, in which case everything has hexproof. So the odds of me being able to remove any of it, let alone all of it, are really, really low. Uh, this forces me to win with Infect, which is not impossible, but if he has a creature on the, f on the battlefield, it probably means he has a flyer, so getting Infect through is going to be a little bit difficult. But that about wraps it up for my opponent sideboarding. As for myself, I think I want to bring in both copies of Dismember. Playing against such a creature heavy deck, uh, a little extra removal is always a good thing, but particularly it's here for Drog Skull Captain. I need to be able to kill his first Drog Skull Captain with his second Drog Skull Captain on the stack, or just before it resolves, before he has a chance to play it. So there might be several good ways to use Dismember, but most importantly, I think it's to kill Drog Skull Captains. I also brought in both copies of Heroic Intervention, and I've noticed doing these videos that I seem to bring in Heroic Intervention quite a bit. Do I sideboard this card too much? Like, is it actually good here? Let me know what you think in the comments below. But my reason for bringing it in is the same as my reason for a lot of decks where I bring it in. It might be useful to protect me from Path to Exile, because I know this deck has access to Path, and also, this matchup comes down to combat math more often than not, so if I can use Heroic Intervention to save my whole board after making what would otherwise be bad blocks, I might have a chance to swing on the crackback. Again, I don't know if that's a good enough reason to bring this card in, so let me know what you think in the comments below. Besides Heroic Intervention, I brought in all four copies of Nature's Claim, because my opponent is playing the color white, therefore he might have Stony Silence. And it's better to have a Nature's Claim and not need it, than to need one and not have it. Especially when your opponent is playing spells like Stony Silence and Worship. Also, incidentally, it might be nice to blow up their Aether Vial if they start turn one Shockland Aether Vial, but mostly I'll be saving it for those good sideboard cards. And last, but certainly not least, I brought in my one copy of Graft Digger's Cage. So that has a one mana artifact that reads, Creature cards can't enter the battlefield from graveyards or libraries, and players can't cast cards in graveyards or libraries. So this card is particularly good against decks that interact heavily with their graveyard. And while Spirits doesn't interact heavily with their graveyard, it does play Collected Company. So the clause, Creature cards can't enter the battlefield from graveyards or libraries, does hit Collected Company. It essentially means with this card on the battlefield, they can't Coco. So I only have it as a one of, but I thought it was worth bringing in because some of the scariest plays from Bant Spirits involve Coco at instant speed. So I think that about wraps it up for the sideboarding. 
And without further ado, let's jump back into game two and see if I can do a little bit better this time. Alrighty, we are back with game two. I certainly made a few misplays game one. It's hard to say if I would have won the game uh, without those misplays, but uh, at least I get to be on the play this time around. And it's not nearly as flashy as my game one opener. Um, and a pretty weak Ancient Stirrings as well. I mean, I don't think I need the lands. Yeah, animation module is the only pick, even though I'm not that excited about it. Yeah, against a deck like Spirits, this is not the kind of opener you want. <laughs> uh, was even with my amazing opener last time, it ended up not really being enough. So hopefully he's off to kind of a slow start as well. I feel like that'll be a kind of important and actually it looks like he is. So there's a chance. Interesting animation module. And another Ancient Stirrings. Well, perhaps I should have mulliganed this hand. Hands that depend on multiple Ancient Stirrings rarely turn out. But I mean, hey, there's some good cards in there. So I've got animation module from the first Stirrings and then hanger back locker from the second. Hopefully next turn I play my third land, hanger back walker for one, make a servo. Seems like it's not a bad line to pursue. I just gotta hope my opponent doesn't uh, go crazy. I mean, selfless spirit, okay. Spirits isn't one of the decks that has like an explosive turn two, particularly. Um, it's more like the kind of deck that gets value out of turns 3 and 4 by holding up spell quellers and that kind of thing. So this is kind of like my last chance to do to do my thing unimpeded or without the risk of being impeded. And while this is certainly not a very good start, it's better than nothing. It could always be worse. I mean, my opponent could have led with a Mausoleum Wanderer and swung for two last turn. But instead he'll simply swing for two now. No blocks, no effects. Interesting. So he's been playing his Shocklands tapped. Not really... he's not really coming out of the gate swinging. So I think I have a chance with my... with my, my slow hand may actually have a chance here. I can see a Heroic Intervention and two copies of Walking Ballista, I think is what I can see in my hand. If those are Walking Ballistas, I hope I play one on two. Interesting. I think I would have preferred to spend four mana where X equals two, make a servo, and then shoot the Selfless Spirit for one. Well, there's nothing else on the battlefield. Although he could be holding up rattle chains, give his uh, selfless spirit hexproof. I guess that would suck, but I think it was worth at least trying. So there's one more misplay to add to the list. <laughs> yeah, it's really important that you get a good night's sleep, have eaten well, and are really firing on all cylinders before you go play magic. Because magic is hard. It's really easy to make mistakes. Actually, if there's one thing that I've learned from uh, starting this YouTube channel and posting all my matches online, is that I actually make a lot of mistakes. And if you're trying to have that pointed out, like if you want to learn from your mistakes, there's no better avenue than letting the entire internet like rip you apart. <laughs> oh, but that's that's why I love you guys. I, I honestly have learned like so much, um, like so so much from all the comments on my videos. So really, I gotta say thank you for, for helping point out all my misplays. I've become a lot better player, I think. But uh, my opponent played a basic planes and then passed the turn. So that tells me he's got collected company in hand. Like almost for sure. I don't think there's a single other four drop. Or any other reason to like have four mana and simply pass the turn. 
And yet again, I'm playing a walking ballista for one. You know, I do have that heroic intervention in my hand. I think I've been playing uh, a little cautiously, making sure that I leave up um, heroic intervention. Yep, as expected, here comes the Coco. I swung right into that Coco with my servos. I doubt that'll pan out well. I mean, I don't know. What is the right way to play around Coco here? Just not swing? Make him play it at my instep for no, for no blocking value? I mean, perhaps, actually. Perhaps that was the right play. Or, or I'm sorry, would have been the right play. So I can't exactly see... Looks like he's got a Supreme Champion? I'm sorry, I'm blanking out on, 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 on the name. Supreme Phantom. Okay, I knew I saw the Supreme Phantom, and I did not see the Drog Skull Captain. That is a, uh, that's a pretty good collected company, two lords. So he's got some pretty decent blocks. One servo each with these two creatures. Kind of interesting. I think if he has the opportunity, like I'm swinging with a 1-1 one -one walking ballista, it seems probably correct to, uh, to block the walking ballista. Force me to shoot him in the face for one or, uh, or something like that. Because the walking ballista, like all I need to do is draw a hardened scales even. That would help a lot. Or like especially if I drew an Arcbound Ravager. It could turn the walking ballista into a serious problem. So I think, I think I kind of came out ahead with by my opponent not blocking in that way. Like I still have a chance to play a good game, although spirits does as spirits does, and they he's got a pretty fast clock in the air like already. Feeling awfully reminiscent of game one, I have to admit. I think he swung with like practically the same creatures. It's all it's always good to, to count it out twice. Double check your math, but it looks like he's swinging for nine. Yeah, go to seven. So what are my outs? I think really it's like Arcbound Ravager. Help, that would really, uh, that could help me make one of my walking ballistas, like huge. Ooh, worship, gross. Just like we were talking about in the sideboarding section. I was kind of worried he would have access to that card. Like right now, for me to kill his whole board, um, well because of Selfless Spirit, it's going to take more than one turn, no matter what. So we'll see what happens. This is not looking good. The fight does not go well for our hero. <laughs> so I have enough mana to activate one of the uh, walking ballistas again. And that seems to be the line. Man, this is not good. Well, the only spirit that does not have X proof is the Drag Skull Captain itself. So my options are kind of limited. I could choose to, uh, to ping the Drag Soul Captain three times and just trade off my Walking Ballista. But with the last trigger from the Walking Ballista on the stack, if he so chose, he could sacrifice the Selfless Spirit to give the Drag Soul Captain indestructible. And getting rid of the Selfless Spirit is not quite as helpful as getting rid of this Drag Soul Captain. But honestly, either one, and, um, and I live next turn. As it sits now, he has lethal on board. Whether I remove the Drogsville Captain or the Selfless Spirit, he no longer has lethal. So this is a good line to pursue, kind of like no matter how he handles it. And here, my opponent and I are just discussing kind of like how the stack works. I think he's asking a really good question, like with the last ability on the stack from Walking Ballista, if he uses Path to Exile, will the ability still resolve? And I tell him yes, I think it will. 
I mean, I'm, I always try to do the best that I can to help other Magic players. Um, I mean, you don't want to, like, tell them how to beat you, which I think may have been my mistake in game one. Um, but I think it would be kind of shitty to, like, you don't even have to mislead them, really, but just withholding information, like not laying it all out on the table, as it were, and hoping that they don't catch something. I feel like I would rather my opponent has, like, all the information before he makes his decision. I mean, if this was, like, round eight at a GP, and it was my winning in to day two, I might be a little less forthcoming with information, but, uh... Let's see, back to the game at hand. Path to Exile, Hangerback Walker at my instep. I've been saying Hangerback Walker. I mean to say Walking Ballista. I always get those two names confused. Um. Oh yeah, this is another one of my misplays actually. So with Path to Exile on the stack, I tried to shoot Selfless Spirit for one. Forgetting about, uh, entirely forgetting about Supreme Phantom. So here I'm like, gosh darn it. I'm considering, like, using my other walking ballista to shoot it just to finish the job. But no, two for wanting myself in that way feels really, really bad. I think that, uh, my last walking ballista is more important to me. Like, to un I need to untap with it and put more counters on it and yada yada. It's not worth just killing it now to cover up a misplay like that. Yeah, honestly, these misplays have been kind of brutal talked about it a little bit in the first game how important it is to get a good night's sleep and make sure you're feeling like a hundred percent because in matchups like this it's gonna be close like you if both players are making the right plays it is gonna be close and just one or two misplays is kind of all it takes to um, to no longer accrue the incremental value that you need to accrue in order to win the game it's like there's ten different junctions and you have to make either turn left or right. You gotta make the right choice at each junction. Uh, you mess up one time, and now it's a lot harder to win the game. And I've messed up several times. So, I'm at one, and my opponent is at 15 because of it. <laughs> Again, it's not the end of the world. I mean, I feel like I learn a lot more from a loss, anyways, than I do from having won a match. Of course, winning feels nice, but as long as you're having a good time, and you're learning something, uh, I think that the match was, was good and, and worth it. So it looks like I drew a hardened scales, but too little too late. If I already had an Arcbound Ravager, I think there would be enough enough artifacts here to sack my way into lethal just from uh, from the Walking Ballista. Well, or not actually, because of the worship. So here, I'm just discussing it with my opponent, like I'm telling him, I don't think I see the line. Yeah, he doesn't either, so it's official. We went ahead and shook on it. I lost this one 0-2. So while that's not a very impressive record, I thought that there were some misplays on my part that I should highlight um, in the interest of preventing other people from making the same misplays. It can still be a great game of Magic, despite it not going the way I had planned. So, anyways. I really appreciate you guys for watching. Uh, as usual, if you enjoy content like this, you can let me know in the comments below or by hitting that subscribe button. And don't forget to check me out on Twitch, Twitter, Facebook. I'll have all the links under in the I will have all the links in the description below. Um, so until next time, I'll see you guys later.